I'm here to talk today about cancer research in the news, separating hope from hype, and my goal is to pro provide you with some insights into how I go about doing that, as well as to offer some tips and resources to help you do that as well. So first I'll give you a little bit of background about uh, what I do. I was a health and science reporter for Business Week for, for 10 years. Uh, I'm the author of two books, including Heal. Um, I'm also here as a former caregiver myself. My sister, Beth, battled gastric cancer and unfortunately lost the battle in 2010. And um, that it really inspired me to write a book about cancer research, and the book is all about my search for hope <laughs> in uh, cancer research. So these days I'm a journalist and I, I write for a variety of publications including Fierce Pharma, Forbes.com, and Cure Magazine, which is a cancer magazine for patients and caregivers. And so in my work for Forbes, I blog on a variety of health-related subjects. And so for example, in March of 2015, I wrote a rather critical story about a 60 Minutes segment that was spotlighted cancer immunotherapy research at Duke University. And that post went viral, as they say. Uh, it's still my um, most popular story on Forbes.com, and I thought it would be a good example to use here to explain why I felt that um, this was actually hype. And uh, so first I will show you a preview and a clip from that 60 Minutes segment which appeared on CBS News a few nights before the show, and then we'll discuss it afterwards. We have some remarkable results in a daring new therapy for brain cancer. Researchers at Duke University have turned the polio virus into a predator that attacks a relentless cancer called glioblastoma. In a 10-month project for 60 minutes, we've been following the patients in this historic experiment. Dr. Henry Friedman is deputy director of Duke's Brain Tumor Center. I wonder, of all the trials and all of the theories and all of the treatments that you have hoped for, all of these years, how does this stack up? This to me is the most promising therapy I've seen in my career, period. Dr. Matthias Grohmeyer created the virus using genetic engineering to make cancer its only target. You have been testing this therapy against a number of other cancers just in a laboratory. Yes. What have you been able to kill so far? Uh, so we have done this for lung cancers, uh, breast cancers, colorectal cancers, prostate cancers, pancreatic cancers liver cancers, renal cancers. We probably see this is just about any type of cancer you can imagine. Okay, so you just saw about a minute of what would ultimately be more than a half hour of broadcast time dedicated to the engineered polio virus. Yet two of what I call red flag words were in there, remarkable and historic. And during the actual broadcast, they also referred to the virus as a miracle and a cure. To me, it was all a giant red flag, and, and here's why. Only 22 patients had been treated with the virus at the time of the broadcast, and half of them had died. That's a very small sample, and it's not nearly enough to guarantee that the drug will ultimately be approved by the FDA. In fact, it was a phase one study, uh, which is primarily designed to test safety, and of course, you hope you get some signals of efficacy, but phase one studies are really designed to test safety. Hundreds more patients will need to be treated to determine if, in fact, the treatment works. But the bottom line, as I said, is half of the patients uh, treated at the time of the broadcast, for them, it was neither a miracle nor a cure. So there are other words that, that I think are very hypey and that should be tuned out altogether. So what do remarkable and groundbreaking and historic mean exactly? Well, as I pointed out in my Forbes piece on this. Cancer-killing viruses are actually not a new discovery. The science dates back to the 1800s. In fact, uh, Dr. Wolchok was talking about that this morning, about immunotherapy. Uh, and furthermore, there was a virus-based cancer treatment that was much further along in the development process than the Duke project was. Uh, that treatment we also heard about this morning, it derived from the herpes virus, was actually approved by the FDA about a month after this piece ran. Yet, uh, they didn't mention it in the story, 
And so in, in my opinion, um, Duke's work is neither groundbreaking nor historic, but you, don't really, you didn't really get that from the 60 Minutes uh, piece. Now, I'm not saying that the work isn't important. In fact, I think cancer-killing viruses are really exciting, particularly in cancers like glioblastoma, where there are, so, there are so few good options for patients. I even include a whole chapter in my book on engineered viruses because dogs are also participating in clinical trials of these viruses. And if they work for people, they most likely will work for dogs as well that develop cancer. So I'm merely suggesting that some reports on developments like this may leave patients with the wrong impression, that science that's still very early in the development process is going to provide cures tomorrow. And uh, that's often not the case. So there's one word here that I put in red that's particularly confusing both for journalists and for readers, and that's breakthrough. A few years ago, the FDA launched a program called Breakthrough Therapies Designation, which is awarded to companies or academic groups that are working on particular therapies for serious diseases. And the FDA grants the designation to help speed up the approval process for some drugs, but unfortunately, it sometimes gives the wrong impression. So here's what the FDA actually means by breakthrough designation. It's a drug to treat a serious or life-threatening disease where preliminary clinical evidence indicates the drug may be a significant improvement over existing drugs. The FDA will expedite the review process for a drug-granted breakthrough therapy designation, but it does not guarantee it will approve that drug, nor does the designation signify that the FDA actually thinks the drug is a breakthrough. So about a year after that 60 Minutes broadcast, the FDA, in fact, granted breakthrough therapy designation to the Duke Glioblastoma Project. And 60 Minutes took that as an opportunity to rebroadcast the segment and update it with that news. However, they did not explain what the designation actually means. They merely used the word breakthrough uh, to hype the research. So here are some of my top tips for separating out the hype in, in news. Whenever you see something that's hailed as a breakthrough or one of those other words that I showed you, go to the original source of the news, which is often a press release. You'll find it on the website uh, of the responsible organization. Um, and you can, by the way, feel free to read press releases, uh, even if it says media room or press room or something. You don't have to be a journalist to go there. Definitely go there, read the press release. Um, I, I have a recent example of, of how I did this for another story I wrote for Forbes. You guys might have seen this. Remember that ice bucket challenge from last summer? There were a lot of reports recently saying that this resulted in a breakthrough discover, discovery related to the neurological disease ALS. The news supposedly came from the ALS Foundation, which had given the money raised during the Ice Bucket Challenge to several research groups. Well, guess what? The word breakthrough did not appear anywhere in the press release. The press release merely said that a paper had been published about a genetic discovery made by a team that had received Ice Bucket funding. But the discovery wasn't new, nor was it a breakthrough. What probably happened was that one reporter looking for a catchy headline used the word breakthrough, and it was picked up by several other news organizations, which unfortunately happens regularly. So you can also go to the website pubmed.com and find the original studies that the media is covering. We were talking about that this morning. It's important to look at how the trial was designed, what the drug was compared to, for example, in the trial. Uh, you learned earlier today how to read an abstract. Uh, anybody can do this. I'm not a PhD or a doctor. I read abstracts and full studies all the time. They're often available for free, by the way. Uh, and I also recommend that people go to clinicaltrials.gov uh, if something has been in the news, that's a good site to go to to see at what stage the, the uh, research is at. Also, if you're interested in possibly volunteering for a clinical trial, you can see where the trials are recruiting. And uh, of course, through all of this, you should ask your doctor for his or her opinion of something that's getting a lot of attention in the news. It's also worth mentioning that there's been an unfortunate increase, I think, in media attention 
paid to trials that are way too premature to draw any conclusions from. As I mentioned, that 60 Minutes story focused on a phase one trial with a small amount of patients in it, and phase one trials are not really designed to prove efficacy. Um, there's been no phase two or three data published from the trial yet. Those trials are ongoing and recruiting patients now. So it's really impossible for any member of the press to determine if the engineered polio virus is likely to work in a large patient population. And in that clip I showed you, you may remember the huge list of cancers that the scientists said the virus was effective against, quote, in a dish. That means they mixed the virus with some cancer cells in a Petri dish and voila, the polio killed the cancer. But that does not mean it's going to work in actual patients with cancer. So it's important to remember, phase three trials in people are what, de uh, are what determine the difference between a failed drug and a success, and it may take many years of research to actually get to phase three. So if you saw me out there with my book, Heal, you probably know that all of these tips are coming to you from somebody who wrote an entire book about how dogs with cancer are participating in clinical trials of drugs that are being developed for people. Uh, because these are dogs, these trials are considered very early. And when they succeed in dogs, that in no way guarantees success in people. And I confess, I did use the word cure probably more than once. Chapter one of the book actually features a dog named Basil, a golden retriever that was dubbed the miracle dog after he participated in a clinical trial and was cured of a cancer that should have killed him. Uh, but it's a book, so I had plenty of room to provide the context that I just told you is so important for you to go out and find. So I explained that the dog was cured by a drug that went on to be approved to treat people but that has actually only been a miracle cure for very few patients. I gave the exact number of dogs that participated in the trial and said how many were cured of their cancers, which unfortunately was not 100% of the dogs. And so uh, what's unfortunate is that, that this context is usually missing from a lot of newspaper stories, blogs, and TV sound bites about the latest developments in medicine. So it's up to you to go out there, find it, and hopefully I provided some good tips and tools for you to do that. So thank you for listening and happy to take any questions. Somebody up here? <laughs> Just waiting for the microphone. Hi, when you spoke about how sometimes journalists can, you know, overhype things in order to get a story, to get eyeballs. But what about also some of these, you hear a lot of, about alternative treatments that certainly uh, push the envelope with promises, and most of it's antidotal. There's not even studies. How do you, as a, an author and journalist, when you see those things out there in social media or even in major publications? I'm sorry, what publications are you referring to? No, just in general, when we see things in newspapers and on social media about alternative therapies that have no track record and no... Right. Okay. So the question is about alternative therapies. Yeah, that's a particularly challenging area because there's so little research on alternative therapies. It's also not an FDA-regulated um, area of research. So um, when, I, when I tell people you've got to go out and, and see if there's any phase three data... Um, there's usually, often, at least, no data on alternative therapies. And um, it's interesting, my first book was about the anti-aging industry. And um, <laughs> uh, that's a very unregulated area of science. And I actually included a couple of chapters about Suzanne Summers, who you may know, um, believes that she cured her cancer with alternative therapies. And uh, there's no science to prove that. And as a science writer, you know, I, I, um, I tend to filter that stuff out. Um, I have written quite a bit about lifestyle choices that people make and how they might um, contribute to cancer prevention. Uh, and there is actually a lot of research uh, in that area. But I am 
I, I try to be very skeptical about the research um, because a lot of the studies contradict each other. I did write uh, last year about um, all the contradictory studies about aspirin and coffee and how, how um, being a regular user of, of those might prevent cancer. Unfortunately, it's, um, it's not so cut and dry, the science. And so I, I try to be um, skeptical. It was a habit I learned at Business Week. We always had to have the to be sure paragraph, as they called it. And, and, and any um, new exciting research that we described always had to have the, the caveat of what still hasn't been proven. Uh, we have some questions up here. So I think, um, thank you for that presentation. I think one of the biggest things that I struggle with in trying to educate people about the science of cancer is the difference in levels of evidence that having two friends say such and such cured my cancer is not the same level of evidence as having 200 patients in a clinical trial. So how would you suggest we approach that? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. The, the, the question was about discrepancies in, in research and the difference between having a success in two patients versus 200 patients uh, or 2,000 patients. Uh, often these trials have to be very big in order for the drug to get approved. And um, that was actually the main thing that disturbed me about that 60 minutes piece, and that stuck out to me, uh, was that it was 22 patients at the time of that broadcast. It's a very, very small sample, and there are many examples of drugs that look so promising in small patient groups, and then they expanded out the trial and um, the drug failed. And so, like I said, I do think it's, it's very important to, to wait for more evidence in larger patient populations to really um, scrutinize the research, look at what the drugs were compared to, uh, whether it was a placebo or standard of care, um, and, and to be critical about what you're seeing. Uh, in the update to that 60 Minutes piece, um, they actually reported that one of the patients that they originally called a miracle had died. And uh, so what did they do? They went out and they found another patient <laughs> who did really well in the trial and they profiled him and it, you know, it just, it, it, it's, it's tough. I mean, it, on the one hand, you wanna have hope for these very cutting edge therapies, but on the other hand, I think it's important to be realistic. Um, one caveat on that, though, um, targeted therapies, which is what I'm on, my drug was actually approved based on a clinical trial of 30 patients. Mm -hmm. Because when you find a drug that 80% of the patients respond to, you don't necessarily want to wait until you've had a full phase three clinical trial and keep patients from having access to that. So we right. got the breakthrough status on it, and they have to continue doing a trial in the larger population. Right. So. And, and yes, it's true that they are approving some drugs on, uh, based on very small trials, and I, I do think that's important, and usually they do have to go on and collect data in large pa patient populations. And um, so, uh, but still, I think it's important to realize that, um, that even targeted therapies um, don't work for all patients, and, and you know, to, to be realistic going in. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I also think it's important to tell people that just because a drug is FDA approved, it doesn't mean that all the studies that were done on that drug uh, were successful. They only need, you should tell them how many trials of success to have a drug passed. And a lot of times, you know, the drug companies do want to get it approved for other uses, and that way they can sell more of the drug. So I think that people also need to be aware of all the studies that are done on the drug that they're considering. Right, and at clinicaltrials.gov is a good place to, to go to see uh, what kind of research is going on and just how advanced the research is. Are there any other questions? There's some over here. Hi, um, more media related question. Um, I'm a documentarian and for myself and my subjects, I'm always asking, about ethical practices in journalism and documentary. Um, for younger people um, and older millennials like myself, what do you see as particular pitfalls within the field of media that would maybe be doing more harm than good to your subject material? In this case, um, immunotherapy research. We're talking about hype um, and 
those who work at CBS are usually very highly educated people that have somewhat questionable ethical practices. What advice, and I, I'm, I'm serious, but what theme do you see as a pitfall for maybe advice for younger people in the field to maybe correct some of the um, I don't know, pitfalls or wrongs that are out there? Younger people in the field of journalism? Yes. Okay. Oh, that, that's a good question. Uh, I think that younger people, unfortunately, are under pressure to produce a lot of content, and that leads to lazy practices, such as picking up on things that other journalists have written and not taking the time to make those phone calls to talk to the sources who are going to help you separate the hype from the hope. Um, a lot of them, unfortunately, don't have time because uh, news organizations have cut back and, the, and um, journalists have to do a lot more than they had to do when I was starting my career. Everybody's expected to film video and post things on the web and blog about their stories after their stories run, and um, it's a lot of pressure. So I, my advice to young journalists is, especially reporting on, on science, is to be skeptical, go out, talk to the experts, ideally talk to more than one expert who does not have a personal interest in the topic, meaning they're not a clinical trial investigator, they're not the drug company, they're not a patient or a caregiver, they're just an oncologist who understands the cancer, if, if we're talking about cancer, and who can, um, can look at the research uh, objectively and, and tell you all the pros and cons. I think that's really important to do, even under a time crunch. Okay, thank you, everybody.